you happen to be. Thank you very much for taking the time to join today's webinar. My name is Scott Dill, and I'm a business development manager here at the Real Story Group. Our company founder, Tony Byrne, will be joining us momentarily to walk through the future of SharePoint and how that aligns with the new digital workplace. I see that we have several subscribers on the line, and we thank you for being Real Story Group customers. For those that are new to us, just as a quick overview, we're a little bit different from traditional research firms that you may have worked with in the past. Our focus is not on which is the best or worst vendor, but rather helping you select a technology that's the right fit for your specific scenarios and strategic considerations. As Tony will walk through in the presentation, we actually have tools in place that can help you to develop a short list that's customized to your specific um, scenarios and strategic considerations, along with a real score product where you can benchmark your digital effectiveness. Really, the hallmark of our, our company is that we don't do any work for the vendors that we evaluate. We don't accept money from them uh, for special treatment in our research. We don't advise them on their strategies, nor do we speak at their conferences. What that means to you is that when you're leveraging our expertise to either select new technology or benchmark your incumbent systems, you'll be seeing a really a pull no punches approach to the weaknesses and strengths of these technology solutions. Our analysts have developed a reputation of being the toughest critics in this space, and quite frankly, it's something that we're particularly proud of. So before I turn things over to Tony, I just want to remind you that if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the questions window in GoToMeeting, and we'll either get to those during the presentation or at the conclusion. With that, Tony, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, and just a reminder to everybody on the line that uh, you'll all receive a copy of this presentation within 48 hours. Those of you who are Real Story Group subscribers will have also have access to a full recording of this on demand. So it's going to be a real fast-paced half hour as usual. We're going to talk about some key themes as we think about SharePoint going forward. Then I'm going to speculate a little bit about the future of it and how that aligns or doesn't align with this concept of the new employee-centric digital workplace. And then, of course, we always wrap up with some advice, what you should be doing going forward. So this is our famous vendor map of all the different technologies that we cover, and each line represents a, a different marketplace. And Microsoft is li both literally and figuratively at the very center of the map, always has been. Uh, it's where a lot of these lines cross. Um, certainly, Microsoft is at the center of many corporate intranets and collaboration efforts. But as we start to expand the scope of our thinking beyond sort of just intranet and collaboration towards more digital workplace, I think it calls into question just what we should have Microsoft do and, and not do. And, and what is, where is Microsoft going, not just with SharePoint, but of course with its other tools. So let's dig into that. I think for, for a lot of you on this call, uh, you have spent the last potentially 10 to 12 years really building up your SharePoint quote-unquote estate, often with the encouragement of Redmond. And many of you have built, you know, beautiful, almost palace-like SharePoint implementations. Of course, it took a lot of time and effort and, and education, um, but it's often kind of a fixed place in your, in your enterprise architecture and in your digital workplace. Um, the issue that I think everyone is confronting is that, you know, in, in a more agile digital workplace, having this kind of big estate model maybe doesn't, doesn't fit so much anymore. And the other argument that I'm going to make is that three years ago, Microsoft pretty much uh, clearly rejected this model, even though they had been encouraging it for the previous 10 years. And, of course, that's causing a lot of distress in the broader customer base and, and some confusion about where and how to, to go forward. So there's really two key themes today that I'm going to center this conversation around. And, and so imagine yourself sort of in that SharePoint state. And, and there's really two things you need to do here. One is to look inward, and the other is to look outward. So look inward first and really ask ourselves, how effective have we been with SharePoint, and where do we need to improve, right? So look at ourselves before we look at, at, at Microsoft or the marketplace, but then also look out, which is, 
how much do we want to invest in in Microsoft's sort of next generation here in terms of the collaboration capabilities in Office 365? And indeed, what are our alternatives to SharePoint if we don't go all in with Microsoft? So these are kind of the two major themes that I'm going to explore. And, and, and by way of starting out, I'm going to talk about what we call the, the SharePoint paradox. And the SharePoint paradox is simply this. It, it's an incredibly feature-rich platform, always has been, and with each version, including through 20, 2016, um, has become increasingly what, what technologists would call feature complete. You could argue that maybe from a social collaboration perspective in particular, um, it didn't necessarily do everything as well as you would like, but the, the, certainly the features are there. The challenge for us is that what business people are not looking for so much are actual features, but specific applications that are built on top of these platforms to do things like communities of practice, innovation support, expertise location, enterprise networking, knowledge base management, social Q&A we know is increasingly important. And when you look at it in that context, then SharePoint comes up really a little bit thin um, in terms of actual out-of-the-box applications. It does a pretty good job at project collaboration and knowledge base management. And we'll talk about how this, this, this story doesn't actually change too much even if you start thinking about Office 365. So the SharePoint paradox is that it's feature complete but application poor. And so from a, from a customer perspective, you know, this, this has always been, been a dilemma. And, you know, the, 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 the two ways that, that you could think about SharePoint, and Microsoft at various times has called it, has gone both ways with this, is one is it's a platform. So you can customize it um, at the expense of long-term maintainability. So you get higher business value, but obviously lower maintainability, higher costs. And for many of you, this turned into a bit of a dead end, and I think Microsoft pretty abruptly decided that this whole approach was a dead end, and so they went towards a more productized approach, much more out of the box of Office 365, which is you're going to get some basic team spaces and file sharing and portal services, but the extent to which you can customize it is dramatically curtailed. Um, so in terms of IT maintainability, much easier, simpler, probably lower cost, uh, but with, of course, much less business flexibility. So, you know, this has always been a bit of a debate within the analyst community. Is Microsoft really a, a platform? Is it a product? And I think Redmond, after going both ways, has finally decided in the end it's a product, even though many of you are sitting on very platform-like SharePoint estates right now. So this then takes us to what what is the future of SharePoint? And I, I think if we look at this, that, that we have we have really passed the era of what I would call peak SharePoint. So I'm riffing a little bit here on the concept of peak oil, and that's where this chart comes from about oh, supposedly the oil reserves and whether we are at peak oil. And I think that somewhere in the 2013 time frame, we reached the era of peak SharePoint. And what Microsoft decided really was that this whole model of an on-premise, infinitely customizable platform was a dead end. Um, they pushed, uh, in many ways, uh, the, uh, their enterprises to go to the cloud-based version, unfortunately, without really much of a migration or hybrid model to help people get there. And so I think that was a real issue. But in terms of, of SharePoint, I think it's safe to say that it's peaked. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have value anymore or that you can't get value out of it anymore. And clearly, Microsoft is going to keep enhancing it, both the on-premise version on a triennial schedule, and certainly bits of SharePoint that have gone into Office 365. But I think that we've passed the era of peak SharePoint. And so what that means is that Microsoft and the ecosystem and others, their attention is sort of, I would say, dissipating into other areas. And as a customer, you just need to be aware of that. What's likely to endure in Office 365 is the same thing that SharePoint was always really good at, which is managing Office files and providing lightweight portal services. A lot of those portal services remain to be realized, but I think that's going to be the, the model through which Redmond and others deliver specific applications in the Office 365 environment is through these sort of customized portals. So initially the question was, where did, where did SharePoint go? This was a screenshot from Office 365 earlier this year, um, and you'll see down here there's this little site thing. So it's almost like Microsoft was was even removing the SharePoint brand as if they couldn't, you know, lose it fast enough. 
since then, they have uh, turned around and, and, and rebranded sites as SharePoint. This is a screenshot from earlier today. And so, okay, sites is now SharePoint again. And, and I think part of this is to help persuade people who have made a significant investment in the on-premise edition that maybe there is some kind of a migration or upgrade path into the cloud. Um, but the reality is that many things that SharePoint used to do are now done elsewhere. And that in particular, in terms of a lot of the collaboration energy, a lot of that has come out of the exchange group uh, within Microsoft. Um, and no, new notions of groups and, and other kinds of collaboration are being built outside of the traditional SharePoint constructs. And what Microsoft is doing here is trying to innovate very rapidly, coming up with new features and then figuring out later how are they going to integrate them. Um, certainly, you know, uh, uh, OneDrive is a, is a great example of that as something that they're just now sort of announcing how it's going to integrate more deeply with SharePoint. So what we have here, though, is Again, an emphasis on features. Um, to be sure, it's now cloud-based. Um, there's a certain, it's a, it's a more holistic environment because it includes Office and some of the Office, all the Office capabilities. Down here, we have a, a video portal, um, which is an interesting concept, and, and, and we're supposed to see more of these from Microsoft and their partners, which are taking some of these services and building them into portals, which have the potential to become actual applications. But you still have the issue here that you have Office 365 is really more kind of a collection of particular features and task-oriented uh, 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 workloads rather than elaborated applications. And so, you know, you have really the same, sort of the same three options that you always had. And, and this slide, or some version of it, I've been showing people for 10 years around SharePoint that you have various choices for converting SharePoint into applications. And I think that it still endures in the Office 365 context. Um, so the first option always was customize and extend, and you could build beautiful things in SharePoint. Um, in the Office 365 environment, not so much customize, but certainly there's a, there's a model by which you can extend it, and many SharePoint partners are doing that now. Um, so that's going to be interesting. Um, they probably a little bit more safer, but still you're in the software development business. The other option was always to sort of supplement SharePoint by putting something on top of it. So the famous version of that were things like Yammer, uh, Tibber and uh, NewsGator, now Citrion. Essentially, that's what Yammer is. So Yammer kind of lives uh, above SharePoint and has some limited um, integration with SharePoint, including Office 365. Um, and so nominally, Yammer sort of plays that. And then the other approach, which many enterprises have done successfully, is to just do certain things outside of SharePoint completely using systems like Jive, uh, Intelligent, and, and others, where you basically have something next to SharePoint and that does a particular application like social Q&A or innovation spaces, does it you know, more effectively than SharePoint, and so you drive your employees there. From an architectural standpoint, of course, that's somewhat inconvenient because you're context switching. Of course, you have to ask yourself, potentially um, context switching a little bit even within the Office 365 environment as well. So I think that going from application to application maybe is just something that in the new digital workplace employees are, are, are going to have to learn to do. But in any case, this is the, the, the sort of SharePoint present and future. And so now let's talk about you know, what you should do. And I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to sort of looking inward versus looking outward. So let's talk first about looking inward. I don't agree with everything that Stephen Covey says, but I always like this quote, treat your employees exactly as you want them to treat your best customers. And certainly we have a lot of paradigms and examples from customer facing digital about how we should behave with the customer at the center of our external digital strategy. And so what we've done is taken that model and adapted it to the digital workplace with an employee centered digital workplace reference model. And the idea is that you start rather with, than with the enterprise forward, the way traditional enterprise architecture works with boxes and arrows. You start with the, with the employee and then work outward in terms of what are the things they want to accomplish, how are they going to accomplish it, what are the specific applications in the blue here that the business should be owning. And then you get more into IT in terms of the platforms that those applications are built on and then in the purple 
all of these enterprise services. Now, you can see recorded webinars where we go into this in much greater detail, but the point is that if you start thinking from the glass backwards as opposed to systems forward, and you really look at this from an employee-centric, it really upends the whole traditional model of the enterprise-first, enterprise-sponsored you know, collaboration space. Um, and you really start thinking about, okay, what is it that knowledge workers want? You know, they want autonomy, they want agency, they, above all, they want to be effective, and they want recognition when they are effective. And, you know, what are really table stakes here is then is doing social collaboration services that, that are going to lie at the heart of any digital workplace. And what this means is that you have to sort of rethink how you're doing your intranet. Instead of email groups, you have online communities. Instead of static manuals, you have searchable collaborative knowledge bases. Instead of just throwing corporate news at people, you have more peer-to-peer -peer sharing with intelligence so and social Q&A. Uh, much more role-based and lighter dashboards. And ultimately focusing less on a collection of internet sites and more in terms of a collection of actual application services that will make people more successful at work. Now the interesting thing about this is that there's a lot of potential for Office 365 to play in the services heavy space, but today it's still a little bit more oriented towards uh, a more personal knowledge management and more information heavy uh, view of, of your internet. So there's, there's going to be some work there. But the first thing to do is to ask yourself whether you're using SharePoint, Office 365, or neither, is just how good are we at this? Um, so I'll just pause here since we're in midpoint and remind people that if you have any questions or comments, anything that you disagree with or agree with, feel free to enter them into the questions tab um, in your GoToMeeting control panel. So how effective are we? And this is a really interesting question. There have been various SharePoint maturity models out there, um, and, and you know those are interesting. They also tend to be sort of an enterprise view of the world. So what we've come up with is some benchmarking uh, services, which um, you can try out for free, uh, which allow you to assess sort of how effective you are using these technologies. And we have one both for SharePoint as well as the broader discipline of social collaboration and, and enterprise content management and others. And what it does is it rates your effectiveness across a series of disciplines, which could be people, information systems. But the interesting thing at the end of it is that you actually get a score where you can compare yourself uh, against peers in your industry as well as uh, broader uh, enterprise participants. And, you know, what this is interesting is that um, it allows you to then sort of break down, okay, where are we doing well? So if we look at this enterprise, they're doing pretty good with respect to analytics and optimization, but they have some serious issues around business resources. So they have resourcing issues that, you know, no matter how well they are in terms of technical resources and processes or governance and program management, they're going to need to really invest in greater business resources if they're going to be effective with SharePoint or Office 365. So first, you know, know thyself, know your gaps, understand where you need to go, and then we can talk about what are the specific steps and checklists you can go through to get where you need to be. So first, look inward, and then secondly, I would say, look outward. So, you know, I was picking on Microsoft SharePoint Office 365 earlier that they do two things very well, and that for other sorts of services, you're going to need to either build or buy them in some ways. I, I would make the same criticism of IBM, Oracle, certainly Google, Facebook, any other uh, aspirant to be a major player in this space, Jive, et cetera. They tend to focus on a couple of different use cases, and then the others are, are often lagging. And so this presents a dilemma because arguably, you know, five or six of these applications are really table stakes if you want to have an employee-centric digital workplace. And so this has pretty clear architectural uh, implications. So, you know, historically, we talk about these two extremes from an architectural standpoint with respect to social collaboration. One is, you know, you align around a major platform, maybe supplement it with some third-party plugin. The alternative, which we have seen uh, not as frequently, but we have seen it done successfully, is to go best of breed, right? And there's pros and cons to both of these. Um, I think that the, particularly with the incredible uh, uh, gravitational pull of SharePoint, that we have seen more enterprises go to the option one here, 
with SharePoint as their major platform. Now increasingly Office 365 as a platform and then looking for sort of add-ons. But I think what we're also learning though is that if you're going to have an employee-centric digital workplace, then there's limitations to which you can actually be effective using a major platform that way. And so I think we're going to see a little bit more, and in fact, we're already seeing a little bit more of a shift from one to two. Now, that doesn't mean that companies are going to completely upend their entire SharePoint estate and go all best of breed. No, but what is going to happen is more hybrid approaches that make space for services that aren't provided by Microsoft. Um, and and we, we see this already in some of our, our, our survey data where uh, we asked earlier this year, what are your plans uh, with SharePoint. So these were primarily, mind you, mid to large enterprises, right? Because that's typically the audience we address. And so any surveys that we show you are going to be skewed towards mid to large enterprises. So 31%, you know, said, look, we're, we're, we're kind of all in with, with Microsoft. Um, uh, but just as many said that we're going to supplement SharePoint Office 365 with non-Microsoft tools for social collaboration. Um, the close to 20% said they're basically going to start transitioning away from SharePoint, potentially leaving, you know, completely. Um, and then about a fifth of you also believe that or, or weren't really sure what your, your strategy was. Um, so, you know, this is really interesting. I think what this suggests is that, you know, there's still clearly a major commitment among at least a, a third of the base to, to sticking with, with Microsoft, you know, come what may. Um, but for everyone else, there's a little bit, I think, of an untethering or maybe I would say maybe a little bit of a deconstruction of the estate and that the transition to Office 365 is almost kind of inviting that. So, you know, what else can you have within your digital workplace? Get, you know, there's clearly a lot of different services and capabilities out there. Uh, a lot of players beyond beyond uh, uh, Microsoft. Many of these uh, can play well with SharePoint, and even more pointedly, sometimes play even better with Outlook um, than Microsoft does. So that's really interesting for organizations where a lot of employees are are in Outlook uh, all day. So then the question arises: Well, you know, how do I find out which one is is the best for me? And, you know, the traditional sort of answer was to turn to one quadrant or another that was generated by a major analyst firm. Uh, these static quadrants are very influential in the marketplace, but the problem with them is they're also very static. Uh, and they tend to overweight things like vendor size and vendor marketing acumen and other things that may not matter as much to you anymore. So what we've done is come up with another tool that, again, you can try on your own called Real Quadrant where you actually input the things that are important to you, your preferences, most importantly, your use cases, your strategic considerations, and then you can weight those and come up with a quadrant that's customized for you. Um, and then, of course, the research is behind it. So you can generate a custom report and PowerPoint outputs and Excel outputs to allow you to share your findings with your colleagues. So it's a different way of kind of breaking down the marketplace and understanding the marketplace, not from the marketplace to you, but from you to the marketplace, you looking at, okay, what makes sense for me going forward? Uh, so with that, I'll remind you that if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the GoToMeeting control panel. And I see a, a couple have arrived already. So while I'm looking those over, Scott, you want to just uh, uh, share a few logistics here and then we'll get to the question. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. And as Tony mentioned, we offer interactive applications that come with a subscription to our research. There's Real Quadrant to help you build um, a customized shortlist that's unique for your specific scenarios, goals, and risk tolerance. Real Time allows you to select um, which vendors you'd like to compare and then see a side-by-side -side analysis of both um, their weaknesses and strengths. And then Real Score where you can assess your current systems, peoples, and processes, benchmark your effectiveness against industry peers and across all industries as well. We're happy to walk you through um, a little behind the scenes tour of the Real Story Group subscriber experience. And if that's of interest to you,
please feel free to email us at the address there on the screen, which is explore at realstorygroup.com. Well, another item of note, uh, Tony and the rest of our senior analysts are available to you in an advisory capacity as part of a plus subscription to our research. Um, our subscriptions start at 6200 and you can learn more right on our website on our Buy Now page where all of our um, subscription options and pricing is listed. And again, you can reach out to us directly at explore at realstorygroup.com. Tony, looks like a few questions have come in. Yeah, quickly, Christina and Kaylin, you will get a copy of the of the deck uh, emailed to you in the next 48 hours or so. Um, and if you, I don't know if your firms are Real Story Group subscribers. If they are, you will also be able to um, you will also be able to review an on-demand version of this. Okay, so Cohen is asking, could you comment on Confluence, Atlassian Confluence versus SharePoint? It's been interesting watching the evolution of Atlassian. I think they are trying to develop a suite of tools, certainly HipChat and, um, and, and Confluence together with some other add-on modules, make an interesting case for covering a variety of different applications. Um, the connection to JIRA is also handy in many cases. Um, but clearly, Confluence is one of those, you know, kind of point solution vendors that can very successfully supplement what you already have with SharePoint. And they have decent SharePoint um, integration as well. So, you know, we've seen Confluence play successfully in, in certain um, environments to fill some of the gaps in terms of applications that SharePoint doesn't always do very well. One in particular is sort of knowledge-based management for unstructured knowledge. Um, and, and uh, you know, Confluence is, is much better at that. Sometimes people are still surprised at the level of effort it takes to customize and get Confluence working as well. But you know, clearly there's a place for, uh, for, for something like Confluence. Brian is asking um, about SharePoint and connecting beyond the firewall. So there's a couple of different, um, there's a couple of different pieces there. You know, Microsoft has been working very hard at opening up sites and certain other things to external participants and has made the economic model around that very attractive. That's an area I think where there's some promise at Office 365. If by beyond the firewall, however, you meant actually doing customer digital engagement, Microsoft really doesn't have a story there um, outside of Dynamics. In terms of SharePoint and Office 365, they've removed the, the web content management components for that and Microsoft really doesn't have a, a web content management story in the cloud anymore. Um, it's really all about uh, employee and partner uh, engagement. Um, and uh, David is saying that the Microsoft collaboration space story teams modeled with SharePoint, Office 365 groups, Yammer groups, Skype for teams. Um, how are you seeing this get, getting sorted out at Redmond? Well, I think, I, David, I don't see this getting sorted out at Redmond. I think that they have a team of rivals working internally, and they're all moving forward uh, with their own products and uh, innovating on their own products, coming up with new products, and then later, um, it, Microsoft figures out, sometimes years later, um, how to put these pieces together. So this is going to be your life. Uh, Chris is saying, um, we don't have a SharePoint today, but we're about to deploy to Office 365. It appears to, that the traditional internet model is disappearing. Thoughts about building traditional internet pages. Well, you're right. I think the traditional internet page model is disappearing. And, um, and I, I, I think, you know, there are ways that you can kind of create pages in Office 365, but that's not really where Microsoft is is going. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens when they come out with their knowledge management portal uh, offering, um, which is nominally where you would have more structured sorts of information. But here I think actually I tend to agree with, with Microsoft's approach that this whole notion of, of pages that you have to keep up to date, that that's not really um, leading edge here and that what you want to be thinking about is more interaction spaces or formal knowledge bases. Um, Ashwin is asking, have you seen any patterns of migration from cloud-based document management systems, e.g. Google Docs and Drive to Office 365? No, not really any patterns of migration. I mean, clearly people who have been messing around with Google Apps and Google Docs as an alternative cloud-based system, some of their uh, employers have caught up now and have standardized on Office 365, and so they've had to then transition to Word and, and others in the cloud. 
I think there's been a little bit of disappointment around that, and we tend to see Google not going away because Microsoft doesn't it can't really keep up with respect to some of the real-time collaboration and other services that you have in Google Docs. Um, so uh, Fraser's asking, do you see something like Office 365 groups replacing SharePoint moving forward with services versus platform? Are they different enough that this isn't likely? I think this is one of the great questions, and my guess is that ultimately Office 365 groups will become the dominant way that you do communities and, and other sorts of applications in the Office 365 environment, if only because historically um, when it's been Exchange versus SharePoint, um, Exchange has always won. Is Mac and PC collaborations problem solved in Office 365 SharePoint OneDrive? No, uh, Magna, they're not. Um, and as a Mac user, I can testify to that. Any thoughts on Facebook at work and its potential impact on SharePoint? This is from Peter. Um, I don't think much impact on SharePoint. I think Chase's are we're really targeting Yammer um, and trying to provide a better user experience than Yammer. Um, and to the extent that Yammer is not particularly integrated into Office 365, it's vulnerable. Uh, I published a blog post on this you can see on our website yesterday. I think the real issue with Facebook is not the user experience but the, but the vendor, which is do you really want to tie your employee digital experience to what is essentially a consumer software company. From a UX standpoint, very attractive. From a long-term risk standpoint, um, there's some real challenges there. Magna is now asking, is Yammer dead, overtaken by someone like Slack? And I would say no. Um, the thing about Yammer was that it was never totally alive, right? All, all it ever really was was an activity stream, and it really addressed only one application effectively, like enterprise conversation. But because it was the only social tool in the toolkit, people tried to do other things with Yammer, tried to make it a community of practice platform, which it is not, tried to make it a collaboration platform, which it is not, um, tried to make it intelligent social Q&A, which it is not, tried to make it team communication, which is not. That's what Slack is really good at. Slack is really is also really a one-trick pony. It's great at team communication, particularly small team communication, where you have multiple overlapping projects. Um, and that's an enterprise use case that was neglected, I think, by a lot. And Slack kind of slipped in there and addressed it, and I think addressed it very um, effectively. Tamara is asking about take on governance. Um, well, we could do a whole half day on governance. We certainly do have some governance models we shared with our subscribers. Um, I would encourage you, Tamara, to visit the, the real score, uh, in, and you can see through some of our self-assessment tools what are some of the things that you ought to be thinking about with respect to, to, to governance. You mentioned a knowledge base offering. Is that on Microsoft's current roadmap? It has been on Microsoft's roadmap for a while to take the model of the, um, of the video portal kind of module and do a knowledge uh, portal module. They've been rather slow, and a number of Microsoft partners are talking about and beginning to deploy some of these things themselves. So keep an eye out for that. Again, it's an area where, unfortunately, I think you may see some beta stuff before you see some really uh, 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 you know, well-developed stuff. Um, so with that, uh, we've gone a little bit over, but thanks for sticking around. Um, Love sharing this stuff with you. As Scott said, uh, feel free to contact us if you'd like to, you know, go and if you'd like to, you know, have a further conversation with one of us directly or get access to our research to make a better case for your strategies and your professional uh, career within your enterprise. So for Real Story Group, this is Tony Byrne thanking you again and look forward to chatting further. Bye now.